Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this uh, evening session of uh, PCR London Valves 2024. My name is Victoria Delgado. I uh, practice in uh, Spain, in Barcelona, Hospital Germán Trias y Puyol, and I have the pleasure to be the anchor person for this session, New Frontiers, Frontiers in Tavi, Have We Reached Them? This is a session sponsored for, by Edwards Life Science. And uh, for the um, learning of uh, objectives, these are my disclosures. And we will try in this session to discover the results of the latest randomized clinical trials in Tavi. And I think also in our stenosis, which is important, the early tower and the REA trial, and to learn how this new data may impact in clinical practice guidelines. We also will be discussing what will be the new frontiers in TAVI, including the treatment of patients with bicuspid aortic valve and moderate aortic stenosis. And for this, we have an STEAM panel with a moderator, Professor Bernard Pendergast, and speakers, Dr. Philippe Junero, um, Professor Elena Elhanihoff, Professor Hendrik Trade, Professor Mariuka Nicotera, Professor Julia Meisterbauer, and Professor Philippe Pivarov. So, this is the agenda. We will start with the early TAVAR trial, and all you need, all what you need to know, how will the early TAVAR findings impact on clinical guidelines and the new frontiers in asymptomatic patients with case examples, and we will have then the discussion, and we will continue with the REA trial, with a deep diving on the uh, trial, and how this will impact in guidelines, and again, the new frontiers. So without further ado, Bernard, if you want to start um, Introducing. Of course. So thanks, Victoria. And uh, although it's been a long day for us all, we're very open for all your questions and uh, we want to make this as active a session as we can. And it's my pleasure to introduce Philippe Genereux, who has had barely time to breathe since the TCT meeting with all the discussion and, and hot uh, airing of the findings of early TAVA. So Philippe, give us a quick summary. All right, I have seven minutes for a 20-minute talk, so I will start right now. So here's my disclosure. So first, the early TAVR, large prospective multicenter randomized trial for severe AS with no symptom patient, age 65 uh, and above, STS score 10 or lower, and EF normal, more than or equal to 50%. The key point of the trial is all the patient had low-level treadmill stress test to confirm that they were asymptomatic, and then they were randomized after CT scan suitability for either TF, TAVR, SAPN3, or ULTRA to clinical surveillance with a primary endpoint of all cause death, stroke, or unplanned cardiovascular hospitalization with all patients having two years follow up. Here's the flow chart, very important point 1578 patients were uh, enrolled. From them, 43% were excluded, with 20% exclude because they already had a class one indication after the CAT scan or they were becoming symptomatic. Uh, and 15% exclude because they were not suitable for TF TAVR with a sapient 3, uh, either undergoing surgery or something else. So we had 901 patient randomized one for one, one, one to one to either TAVR for 55 or surveillance for 46. Baseline characteristics were well balanced between group. As you can see, 76 years old, mean age, woman, 30%. Low risk heart team, 84%. So we had intermediate risk and high risk in the trial. 91 uh, percent uh, of the patient had a stress test with 10% that could not walk on the treadmill were enrolled in the trial. And the key CCQ score was 93, so very high. And 8%, 9% of bicuspid were allowed in the trial. Normal, uh, uh, similar echo, car echo characteristic between group. You can see mean gradient was 47, um, peak velocity 4.3, and a no very normal EF of 67% between group. I'm going to go right to the primary endpoint. As you can see here, the clinical, uh, the um, early TAVR uh, was superior uh, to clinical surveillance with a reduction of 50% of the primary endpoint with an NNT number needed to treat of six at two years for a median follow-up of 3.8 years. That was a composite of death, stroke, and unplanned cardiovascular hospitalization. There is no difference in mortality, and we're gonna talk about that, I'm sure, during the discussion. There is a, a numerically lower risk of stroke, and that was a surprise for us. Uh, you can see at two years, the curves continue to separate in favor of early TAVR, so lower risk of stroke with early TAVR compared to surveillance. We can talk about that. 
and obviously uh, mainly difference based on unplanned cardiovascular hospitalization. Very important, probably the most important slide of the slide deck, early TAVR was associated with a 40% reduction of death, stroke, and serious hospitalization for heart failure, defined as hospitalization with IV diuretic, inotrope, balloon pump, ventilation, or hemodialysis for heart renal failure. So I think this is very important uh, and dependent of the unplanned hospitalization due to AVR. We had second year endpoint. You can see we have a superiority in terms of favorable health status outcomes, so quality of life and being alive at two years. And also, we had more healthy LV and LA at two years, so less structural cardiac damage on the LA and the LV. Very important is the natural progression of the disease in clinical surveillance. You can see that in the surveillance group, 26.2% of the patients were needed in the VR at six months, 50% at one year, and 71.4% at two years, with a median time of conversion at 11 months, which is a concept which is very important in terms of bioprosthetic valve dysfunction. If you think uh, valve durability, this is something the disease progressed quickly, quick, quicker than we thought. What were the symptoms? 83% of patients convert with dyspnea, shortness of breath, with 7% syncope, a loss of consciousness, and 30% at class 3 or 4 heart failure, so not uh, softball symptoms. We group patient based on if the patient was asymptomatic at the time of conversion, with mild symptom we call progressive valve syndrome, or with advanced acute and severe symptoms such as class 3 or 4 heart failure, syncope, drop of EF, um, uh, sudden cardiac death with uh, resuscitation, etc. And we found actually through the study that 40% of the patient converge with advanced or what we call acute valve syndrome, 60% with progressive symptom, and 2% were still asymptomatic when they cross over. The vast majority had class 2A, 2B indication. This is very important is the proportion of patients that present uh, with advanced or acute valve syndrome were consistent through time, including the zero to six month. So 40% of the patients that cross over early were for syncope, heart failure hospitalization, pulmonary edema, intubation. They were not planned crossover. We did an exploratory analysis or additional analysis of the primary endpoint on death, stroke, and uh, unplanned cardiovascular hospitalization due to the, uh, the, those severe symptoms, and dependently, of the crossover for AVR at six months, and we still have a reduction of 50% in the uh, composite endpoint, uh, which is identical of the uh, other primary endpoint. Very important in early TAVR is the promptness and the readiness of treatment. You can see the median time of treatment for patient randomized to TAVR was 14 days, very quick. We didn't lose time, why? Because we had a CAT scan at baseline, the teeth were pulled, we were ready to go, T0 was randomization. And, and the median time to AVR indication to conversion when you have symptom was a month, to 32 days, and 90% of the patients were treated within three months, which I think early TAVR just established a new standard of treatment. If you apply early TAVR recipe, you may mitigate mortality. So peer pressure outcome at 30 days was low, cardiovascular death zero in both arm, stroke 0 0.9 in the early TAVR, and, and AVR with crossover was zero percent. Uh, 1.8%, so very, very good endpoint, and a little bit higher with the delay AVR, 5.7% uh, pacemaker and 8.4%. So I think we concluded that in patient with asymptomatic severe AS, early TAVR strategy result in a significant reduction of the primary endpoint, dead stroke on planned CV hospitalization, and multiple endpoint variation, excluding crossover within six months, still show consistent result. Early AVR was not associated with an excess of mortality or stroke, and, and the stroke finding was surprising, but I think is real. We prevented a clinically meaningful decrease in quality of life in patients with clinical surveillance that subsequently convert to AVR, and we improved the measure of LV and LA function. So we believe that giving the benefit observed in this large prospective randomized trial and the lack of harm, Early TAVR may be preferred to clinical surveillance in patients with asymptomatic severe AS, especially when we combine this with the challenges of timely symptoms recognition and prompt treatment in a real-world setting. Um, obviously, we were uh, published in New England. I just want to spend one minute on the recent meta-analysis of the four randomized trials um, available, the Evolve Avatar Recovery 
and actually early TAVR. Um, you see the number of patients, obviously early TAVR is the largest one. The age is different. Uh, Evolve in early TAVR was 76 years old, was TAVR population compared to avatar recovery a surgical cohort. You see here that the time to treatment is very different. While early TAVR was perfect as A plus, both for prompt treatment in both arm, um, there's delay in treatment that probably explain the benefit of mortality in avatar and recovery, especially when you have symptoms. Waiting for symptoms more than six months on a waiting list kill people, and this is what the avatar recovery actually showed. And this is what the, the finding of the meta-analysis on mortality uh, show when you pull the four trial. There's a, a non-significant trend in decreasing mortality. There's a non-significant trend in decreasing cardiovascular mortality, but mainly the benefit is to prevent heart failure hospitalization, to prevent cardiovascular or heart failure hospitalization, and to prevent stroke with a significant p-value of 0.3. So um, this is a summary of the meta-analysis of the totality of evidence. Um, I think we can certainly say that early AVR, whatever is TAVR or SAVR, uh, decrease heart failure, decrease hospitalization, and decrease stroke. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you so much. So, so thank you very much, Philippe. We're, each of the uh, halves of this session are going to follow a similar um, format. So we're now going to ask Hendrik Trieder to comment on these results and also speculate how they may impact on guidelines. The European guidelines will be updated uh, next year, 2025. The American guidelines will be a little bit behind that timeline. So look into the future for us, please, Enrique. Uh, yeah, I try. I give my best, actually. Thank you. Um, so if you look at the current guidelines for 2021, symptoms are a very central point in the guidelines. Whenever a patient enters your hospital door with severe stenosis, you first ask for symptoms. So this is a central point. And if you then have no symptoms, there's kind of a tree of decisions you have to look for. You look for the LVEF, the physical activity, symptoms or not, indicators of adverse prognosis, and then you somehow go back to the heart team and decide if you treat the patient or not. So if we take the early TAVA results, that would be much easier than because we wouldn't have to, uh, to ask for symptoms anymore. Um, we have discussed, and, and Philippe was showing this, uh, the two surgical trials that have been there already before we um, had the early TAVA result, the recovery trial, comparing surgical AVR with uh, clinical surveillance, showing a clear benefit even in survival for patients for an earlier treatment for the reasons that Philip um, pointed out. And the avatar trial um, showing um, combined endpoint of maze, again, very much in favor for early treatment compared to a later treatment. So on a surgical side, the answer was somehow uh, already there. And now we have, with the early TAVA trial that Philippe just presented, also very good data in a more TAVA-like patient population, elderly patient population, and again, showing in the combined endpoint of death stroke and unplanned cardiovascular hospitalization, a clear benefit for those patients who were treated earlier. So this was quite convincing to me. I would, um, but um, it was only driven, and this has to be made clear, not by death or stroke, it was mainly driven by unplanned hospitalization. But what uh, you know, uh, influenced me the most when I've seen the data is that if you are in the clinical surveillance, it doesn't take long until you come back, actually. So after 12 months, already 47%, so nearly half of the patients will undergo TARBOR anyway. And after 60 months, 95%. So basically, every single patient we follow up on the clinical surveillance will come anyway. But he will not come in a good state, as uh, Philip pointed out, because the symptoms are, are really relevant in these patients. So for me, early TAVA really confirms an outcome advantage from earlier surgical trials in TAVA patient population. Patients under clinical surveillance show a decline in quality of life. And this may also be a very um, dangerous decline in quality of life because if you show up with like syncope, there's also an increase in sudden cardiac death. And the only reason why we don't see this in terms of mortality is because the time between symptoms and treatment in this trial was only three months. But this is not always reality. Not everybody has access to TAVR within three months. So um, clearly, I think we should keep this in mind and think about changing guidelines in this regard.
tablet asymptomatic medication was not related to adverse outcome, so you don't put your patients under any um, uh, danger if you treat them early. And tablet asymptomatic medication is controversial in the absence of uh, randomized trial until today because we now have early tablet. And if you put all this together, all the trials in the field, I think they will have an impact on the guidelines. And I'm personally pretty sure that the next upcoming guidelines will just take out the symptom questions from the guidelines. And you know, if you look at the 21 guidelines, just the lower part here, they were already pointing to it. The guidelines of 21 just were just waiting for these results to be changed. So hopefully, they're going to change. And then this would be our next guidelines. I've already pointed them out. So there's only, you know, is the intervention likely to be of benefit? If no, then of course you don't treat the patient. But if there is a likelihood of benefit for the patient, just go to the heart team. And just, it does not necessarily mean that everybody gets TARBOR. Of course not. I mean, you're asymptomatic, you go to the heart team. And then the heart team again decides whether you get surgery or TARBOR. But at least the patient is treated early enough to get the best outcome possible. Thank you. Now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Julia, who will uh, explain the new frontiers in asymptomatic patients with case examples and how these potential future guidelines could be applied or how the, the current ones need to be changed. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'm going to present a case of a woman, a 64-years-old woman that would not have gone into early tower. But this is a very typical case of patients that we see in Austria, at least. She had a previous hip replacement, and her mobility, of course, was reduced uh, and was referred due to a heart murmur. She felt a little bit tired from time to time. And her diagnostic workup revealed a hyperlipidemia, severe or morbid obesity with a body mass index of 42. Her antiproprium B was quite low with 275. She was a diabetic with um, mildly reduced renal kidney function, and her blood pressure was uh, mildly elevated with 135 over 75. So this is her echocardiogram, um, normal left ventricular function or even hyper um, contractility of her left ventricle and her peak uh, velocity across the aortic valve was more than four meters, five meters per second. So she, she actually had very severe aortic stenosis. And when, you, when we now look just to note on the um, left ventricular outflow tract velocity, so this was elevated indicating a high volume state with 1.25 meters per second. So she eventually underwent workup for, um, for treatment for TAVI, and this is her C or for aortic valve replacement, and this is her CT scout in the heart team. Uh, the, the surgeons refused to, to uh, do any surgical procedure, and this is just to show you the valve assessment. Uh, the uh, valve area was 438, so she had a low, uh, a small aortic annulus, a tricuspid aortic valve with moderate um, calcification, and the SDJ was 552 um, square millimeters, so quite uh, quite large, but not too large. Uh, the, the aortic root was not um, uh, enlarged significantly, and this is to, just to show you the calcification, and there was no uh, outflow tract calcification. The takeoff of the left main was a little low with 7.5 millimeters. At the right coronary uh, takeoff was uh, fine with 12 millimeters. And uh, we, uh, the, 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 the access route was, was good, very good with uh, large uh, vessels. And we then decided, uh, we then discussed which, which um, prosthesis we would like to to take for this really young patient. Um, and taking everything into consideration, we, we had to plan for probably 
a second valve, a TAF in TAF, and uh, because of the low uh, takeoff of the left um, uh, of the left coronary, we choose a Sapiens um, 23 uh, valve plus one milliliter um, because we wanted to avoid a pacemaker. We did then the TAVI procedure. And, do, and before we implanted the valve, we just uh, uh, took a look on the coronaries, which we evaluated up front in the CT scan. So we knew already that there was no, uh, most likely she was free of, of any stenosis. But in this young patient, very obese, we wanted to make really sure. And uh, in addition, she's a diabetic. So this is the procedure. It went uh, straight forward. Um, the Sapien 3, um, 23 plus one milliliter with a very nice result. And the mean gradient we measured invasively was only 10 millimeters of mercury. And this is the follow-up echocardiogram on the next day. She was also discharged the next day. She did not need a pacemaker. Uh, left ventricular function was uh, very good, and her peak velocity was 2.8 meters per second, which is quite high. But her outflow tract velocity was also, again, higher than uh, normal, with a, a velocity of 1.5 meters per second. Yeah, this I would like to conclude. Thank you. So this case opens uh, well the discussion based on uh, uh, what we have learned from the early tower and the questions that the early tower has uh, answered and which one uh, have not, and uh, how the early tower influence in uh, individual practice. I think from the case that uh, Julia has shown, we may face many of these patients that perform an exercise test to make sure that they are asymptomatic and be challenging. How did you deal with that uh, in the tra early tra tower? Yes, yeah, so in the early tavers, so 10% of the patient that could not have uh, or undergo a stress test, we, we, we randomized them, so 10%, and there was no interaction in the sub, pre specified subgroup analysis. I think this is a very important group, especially when you advance in age. The, uh, the max age of the trial was 96 years old, and he didn't do a stress test, so uh, in the 90 uh, years old plus, that's, uh, I think that's important to have a representation. In the trial, we allowed up to 30% of the patient to have no stress as we only end up with 10%, which I think is, 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 is important. Um, and, and I think early tower, in my mind, uh, eliminate the need for stress tests. I think if you want to do a stress test, um, it's just, just to clarify the urgency of the treatment. Um, and, and what you can do an anti pro BNP as well. So I think to, for simplification, do an anti pro BNP. If it's elevated, you have three months to treat. Um, if it's normal, you still have three months to treat. Yeah. I was going to ask, ask Julia, do, do, do you think it's true that this trial says that you, exercise testing is redundant in aortic stenosis? Do, do, you, do you take that message away? Well, no. Um, I think in the first place it has to be truly severe aortic stenosis. Mm -hmm. And I uh, personally, I must say, I never believed in asymptomatic aortic stenosis. Because if you are a, somebody who listens to himself and to uh, the exercise uh, capacity, then uh, you, must f you must have a sense for an outflow tract obstruction. Uh, if I know patients that I have taken to stairs and walked <laughs> up and down when I was a young uh, cardiologist and I wanted to do some stress test and I was uh, really surprised how good these patients could exercise but still if they didn't have an aortic stenosis a significant aortic stenosis I'm absolutely convinced that they would do better so I think that it is redundant that uh, to uh, to uh, assess uh, symptoms uh, we sh uh, this was, came from a time when we only had surgery and we had one shot one surgery at, for, one, for once and ever, because you could not operate a second or third time on every patient, but only on, on a very limited, very well uh, um, uh, 
in a good shape patients. Yeah, and I, and I that's, think, you know, that's how it developed. Yeah, I think the, 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 this trial, early Tiber and the other trial that you know, uh, Philip showed in the meta-analysis will greatly simplify our life. I mean, because now the, uh, the therapeutic decision making will be essentially based on the severity of aortic stenosis to demonstrate that it is, as you said, Julia, uh, true CVIS. And the symptoms will have probably less weight in the decision because there are symptoms, there are no symptoms. Once it will be implemented in the guidelines, of course, which is a good thing because the symptoms are highly non-sensitive and non-specific especially in this elderly population, you know, with many comorbidities, such as this patient, you know, let's say you've been able to exercise her and she has, she develops symptoms, so what, you know, because it could be related to obesity, uh, et cetera. So you could not conclude anything. And if she, she had COPD, same, you know. So I think it will facilitate our work greatly. But on the other hand, we, we know that the outlook, we already know that the outlook of a gradient of 100 millimetres of mercury is very poor. We know that from Raphael Rosenheck's so, yeah, work that's 10 or 15 story. years ago. <laughs> yeah. But what, what we now know in contemporary practice from early TAV is that these patients actually do badly. You know, the, the numbers who cross over in the rainbow chart, as you call it, Philippe, is very dramatic, isn't it? So this is what we see in our clinical practice. So what I like about the summary um, uh, the, of uh, Endrick is, is really, I think is you br have to bring the patient quickly for CAT scan uh, evaluation. So if you have CVRS, bring the patient quickly for evaluation, put your docs in a row. First class one should be quickly sent to a hard team for evaluation. Second, do a CAT scan and you decide SAVR or TAVR based on the anatomical suitability for one or the other. So I think the hard team will be very important. And I think class 2B should be, if you want to wait, if you want to wait, you have normal biomarker, you want to wait is to become a class 2B, and acknowledging that you need to be in a geography where you can have access of care quickly, and you have your plan already. And if you want to go to the wedding of your daughter in three months, or you want to go to Alaska for fishing, it's fine, but you, be a, you have to be informed of the risk of a heart failure or stroke. So I think it's become 2B indication. So I think that in that sense, for example, sometimes we get the criticism or how applicable the guidelines that we produce are for uh, all the counties that we have. And if you are putting the time, uh, do it quickly, it may be that some patients, for example, they need to wait because the access to that service is not that fast. So that is something that um, I like, for example, how Hendrik uh, put it, if it's a patient that is likely benefiting from uh, that, don't uh, wait too long, but what was the time that we will put? Because that is really limiting the access and putting a lot of pressure in, in, in many countries, which I think that should be, you know, <laughs> preferentially done. It's not that I'm saying that we have to wait, but is something that um, the other trials didn't have that yeah. fast time. But I think the total, that is a very important point. The totality of the evidence, for me, recovery and avatar show you that waiting more than six months with symptom uh, is associated with increased mortality. That's why recovery and avatar is positive because the clinical surveillance group were not optimal. And also the peak velocity was 5.1 in recovery, but, but clearly, um, for me, waiting lists killed people, especially with symptoms more than 6 to 12 months. Early TAVR show you that you can reduce mortality or mitigate mortality if you are intervening within three months of symptoms, but you need to be able to do this. If you're not able to mimic early TAVR follow-up, uh, you should intervene right away. And, and if you mimic early TAVR, you're still going to have the price to pay an increase of heart failure and potentially stroke. And we can mi minimize the stroke finding, which was seen across the four trial. Maybe, maybe we should ask uh, Mariuka and LN, what would be the things that might make you nervous about offering TAVI or an intervention for an asymptomatic patient? So I, I think first we have also to ask the question, do we still need the denomination asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis? I think in our practice as doctors, I followed younger patients with severe bicuspid aortic stenosis, and I referred them to surgery straight away. We use now more and more CT evaluation, and I think that in the TAVI field, it will be the same. It's not good to have a high degree aortic stenosis. However you treat it, I think it needs treating. As for the, uh, as for the treadmill test, the Bruce protocol, 
Do we need to do it? I had patients who had ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation <laughs> requiring, uh, requiring resuscitation uh, with severe aortic stenosis. So I think we should be uh, very cautious with regard to, uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, stressing this, uh, these patients. But uh, certainly the, the trial by Philippe uh, will, as, Philippe, as the other Philippe said, <laughs> will make our life uh, easier. And Alain, for the audience, the things that make you worried about TAVI in an asymptomatic? Um, no, what I would like to say is that um, even with very careful clinical surveillance, as in, in a trial, you have this unplanned hospitalization for heart failure, which is a problem because uh, in, in the current practice, you can even don't know this clinical surveillance. So I think in patients who are feasible for transfemoral uh, case, straightforward, uh, due to this reason of hospitalization, which are unplanned, I would go to Tavor. For those who have a, a complicated potential access of risk complications, I would wait because even if there is a hospitalization for heart failure, you know that there is no excess in mortality. So I would balance a little according to the feasibility of uh, transfemoral TV. Just going to say one quick comment. Um, I, got, I had a lot of comments from multiple uh, platforms, social media, real life, saying that, oh, it's soft endpoint. You win with soft endpoint. The reality is 7% syncope, uh, face planting, it's not a soft endpoint. Pulmonary edema is not a soft endpoint. It's, it's soft when it's not happening to you. So, so I think when, 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 when you see patients coming in the hospital and they really say, like they flew it on their lung, on their lung they have to treat for two, three days with IV diuretic, it's avoidable. So I think what we're saying with early TAVR is really put your doc in a row, organize, organize in a civilized way a date in a calendar within three to six months, it's fine. Uh, we don't say jump on a patient for two, in, in two weeks like we did in a trial, but organize everything in a civilized way so it's make the life of everyone easier. And syncope and heart failure is not a soft endpoint. So we've got two quick questions here before we perhaps change gears. So the first maybe is best addressed to Julia. Uh, Dr. Nguyen asks, um, no, apologies, Dr. Stefan asks, is it now time for population screening for aortic stenosis? What do you think about that, Julia, and the elderly? Well, uh, there, it is time for auscultation by primary physicians, I think, and uh, this is, uh, yes, we should screen patients for heart murmurs and then eventually um, diagnose aortic stenosis or something else. Okay, and then Dr. Nguyen's question leans towards you, Hendrik. So firstly, they ask if this patient could lose weight, should they then have an operation? But actually that leans into the question, do you think the results of early TAVA are also applicable to surgery? Uh, yeah, definitely yes. Uh, for the, the last part of the question, the definite yes. If there's severe aortic stenosis, a younger patient uh, without high risk, we should do early surgery. When it comes to obesity, I think it's very hard to, see, uh, to decide on not seeing the patient. Because usually if you do stenotomy in an obese patient, that's a mess. But there are other ways of doing uh, a surgery. And we just had a session where we're showing that transaxillary access. This is excellent for obese patients because you don't have any chest bone involved in opening. And they recover pretty well back up. But you know, I completely agree. This was a patient that had more than just obesity. She was young, but she was also, you know, had hip replacement and other comorbidities that made her potentially a good target candidate. Although, you know, the gradient are worrying me a bit. So a 90 millimeter degree mean gradient after 23 sapien, that's maybe a bit too high. So she may come back uh, in a couple of years, then we have to ask ourselves what we do then. It's a very difficult question to answer and must be based on the patient. Perfect. So I think that with this great example as well in a woman, I think that we have the perfect bridge for the, the next uh, topic. And it's my pleasure to introduce Elena Hanihoff, who will present the results of the REA trial. Thank you very much. So um, the real trial was, was changed totally the subject, but we know that there is a need uh, for uh, data uh, concerning women only, because uh, we have some data, um, ex uh, ex some data suggesting that there is a higher mortality with surgery. We know that women are underrepresented in randomized trial, so there was a need for a, a study which was dedicated to women, and this is the goal of the REA trial, which is a randomized research in women. All 
commerce with TAVI, comparing the outcomes of TAVI with the balloon expandable valve versus conventional surgery in patients in women with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. So this is a multicenter European trial evaluating safety and efficacy of TAVI versus surgery. You see in 12 countries, 48 clinical sites, and uh, the patients were randomized to TAVI using Sapien 3 or Sapien Ultra, and surgery using any commercially available valve. And the primary endpoint was at one year, a composite of all-cause mortality, stroke, and rehospitalization. And the patients were carefully followed uh, up to one year with an echo or core lab. So the patients were screened between 2019 and 2023. In between, we had the COVID period. And finally, we had uh, 215 uh, patients in the TAVI group, 205 in the surgical group, and the excellent follow-up up to uh, one year, up to 98% of follow-up in uh, the patients. So the patients were um, a mean age of 73. They were at low uh, risk score. You can see the STS is only two. In each group. The aortic stenosis was severe, as assessed by the echocardiographic data, data which are listed here, mean gradient on 47, normal ejection fraction. And what is interesting is this population of women only, is that we have 70% uh, uh, of uh, women who had a small annulus as uh, uh, defined by an area of less than 430 millimeters square on CT scan. So the procedural findings are here. So only a balloon expandable, majority of Sapien Ultra, uh, very few, almost none, uh, no concomitant procedure. And when we look at the procedural finding in the surgical group, magnaise in 60%, and we had also sutureless devices which were implanted. In majority were full sternotomy and about 27% having mini sternotomy. It's interesting to look at the concomitant procedures. You see that the cabbage was performed in a combination in 6.8%. There was no aortic analysis enlargement in this population treated by uh, surgery. So this is an important point. Uh, the, the valve distribution in this population of patients who have uh, small annulus in 70% percent. The majority had a 23 millimeter TAVI valve, which is, um, which is uh, fine with this population with a mostly small annulus. And when you look at the surgical group, the majority were uh, 23 millimeter, but we have uh, a 19 millimeter surgical valve and 21 millimeter valve. So we had many patients with a, a, a quite small uh, surgical uh, valve. So the primary clinical, uh, the primary endpoint at one year, a composite of death, stroke, and rehospitalization, was 15.6% um, with surgery, and it was uh, two times lower in the TAVI group. So TAVI was non-inferior to surgery, and it was even su superior to surgery uh, in uh, this uh, trial on the composite endpoint at one year. Of course, it's very interesting to look at the primary endpoint components at one year, and you can see that the, the difference, the statistically difference, is driven by the hospitalization, which are twi two, two times lo uh, less frequent in TAVI versus surgery. At the opposite, mortality rate, which was very low at one year, and stroke rate were comparable between the two groups. Uh, when we look at the key secondary endpoint, uh, we know that uh, with TAVI, you have a higher rate of pacemaker. It's, already, it's also demonstrated in this trial. And the opposite, you have uh, seven, seven, time, seven times higher risk of having fibrillation in the surgical group. You can see 3.3 .3 versus 28, so a very significant uh, difference. Something also very important, TAVI is a less invasive uh, technique and which is very attractive for patients. And it's demonstrated here that 90% of patients can go home after a TAVI in comparison to 50% after surgery. And median hospital stay is uh, much shorter with TAVI than with uh, surgery. When we look at uh, echocardiography finding with the core lab, uh, you can see that the, hemod the hemodynamics are excellent in both groups 
In red, you have surgery. In blue, TAVI. And you can see that the mean gradient is between uh, 12 and 14. And the valve area is above 1.7, which is an excellent hemodynamic result. And you can see there is a, a statistically a better result with surgery uh, compared to a TAVI in this uh, trial. Uh, pa patient prosthesis mismatch, it's an uh, important subject, and we discuss that later during the sage this session. In this pa population with a small annually in 70% of patients, there was no difference between the two groups, between TAVI and surgery. And when we look at the risk of paravalvular regurgitation, there was no difference for moderate or severe, and the, slight dif the significant difference between mild PVR between uh, surgery and TAVI with a higher risk of mild PVR in the TAVI uh, group. Uh, I have uh, the possibility to add uh, uh, the important data because we could uh, do a pooled analysis of REA and the female population of Partners 3. It was presented by Didier Cheche, my co-investigator at TCT, and it's very interesting Ah, the, the, the slide disappeared. But uh, the, the results were exactly the same as with in the REA trial. Uh, so demonstrating that in a pooled analysis with more patients, we, we have exactly the same results with a superiority of TAVI versus surgery and uh, with a, a, a primary endpoint, which was driven by less hospitalization in the TAVI group. So the key message is, is that in women, all comers with severe aortic stenosis, TAVI using a balloon expandable sapien valve was superior to surgery for the primary composite endpoint at one year. This superiority was, essential, was driven by the lower rate of rehospitalization. And uh, we know the, the, the complications which were higher with surgery or higher with, uh, with TAVI. Uh, we, we could demonstrate also the excellent hemodynamics in this population with around two thirds with small annulus. And besides the patient benefit, we have the advantage of the less invasive TAVI procedure in terms of benefit for the patient and healthcare resources, less hospitalization, shorter hospital stay, and more patient discharge home. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ellen. And we continue now with uh, Hendrik, who will tell us about how these results will impact in guidelines. Yeah, thanks, Victoria. So I again start with the 2021 guidelines. So actually, if you look into the hard team decision, sex does not play a role in the guidelines right now. Nobody asks you if you're a woman or a man. So I congratulate the group and Ellen that they did this trial because um, there was obvious reason to do it. And we have to see how we now um, uh, interpret uh, the facts that came out of it. So the fact is that there is a knowledge gap in sex-specific outcomes, that women are underrepresented in current RCTs. Women tend to have, of course, small annually than men. And small annual size is associated, as Helen said, with word outcome for surgery versus TARBA. As we can clearly see on the Partner 2 trial data, this is, uh, of course, an, uh, an older study, but here we could clearly see there is a clear survival difference in patients with small annually in favor of TARBA versus surgery. And a patient prosthesis mismatch is also associated with birth outcome after TARBAR and SABR. We have the data, so if you have severe PPM, your risk of mortality is increased by 1.8-fold. If you have moderate PPM, it's 1.2-fold. Whatever kind of PPM you have, you have an increased risk of mortality. So we have to deal with this. So coming to the RIA to trial results now, Elaine was showing a great difference when it comes to the primary endpoint. Relief for me was the difference was not in death and not in stroke. It was just in um, rehospitalization. And it was also confirmed by the combined data she was showing from Raya and Partner 3, just looking at the woman in both trials, showing again the same difference, but again also no difference in death and stroke. I'd like to have a, a bit more deep dive into the data of Raya. First of all, on the left-hand side, you see the TAVI. You know, the use of a balloon expandable valve that we know has, has excellent results and, you know, hundreds of thousands of patients being treated. On the surgical side, a bit different, more colorful picture, right? So we have 28% sutureless valves. And I'm personally not convinced that they have a place at all in treating uh, severe aortic stenosis. I don't see any value of sutureless valves, actually. And we can have another session on that but this is my clear opinion. Only 27% underwent minimum invasive 
uh, aortic valve replacement. And honestly, you know, in Germany, it's, it's way above 90%. In my center, every isolated AVR is being operated non-invasively. So I don't see the point of having two-thirds of patients being treated by stenotomy. But stenotomy usually doesn't kill patients, so yeah. Then we have 13% concomitant procedures, what, is in, what we very often see in these trials, that there's a combination of AVR plus cabbage and plus other things, and that of course also has a certain impact on risk, but as Helen said, surgical outcome was great, so mortality of 2% after one year, it, it has not somehow influenced the outcome, but what really bothered me the most was 0% aortic annulus enlargement. This to me is not state of the art if you treat a patient population with small annually. And this is then reflected by the uh, surgical valves that have been chosen. If you just look at the Tarver side, 23 millimeter valve in 95, uh, or larger in 95% of patients. So good, yeah? Look at the surgical valve. 45% had 19 or 21 millimeter valves. And as I already said this morning, there is no 90 millimeter valve in my, uh, in my department. It's just not on shelf. You know, nobody can use it. If somebody wants to use the 21 valve, he has to call me and explain why. And if there's no risk for PPM, then he can implant or she can implant the 21 millimeter valve. Otherwise not. And, but in contrast, you know, this was, um, well, this was what I found was very interesting. So we had small valves on the surgical side, 45%, 19, 21. But there was no difference in patient prosthesis mismatch between the two groups, and there was even better hemodynamics for the surgical valves compared to the TAVA valves. Isn't that a bit contradictive? And again, you know, making the point about minimal in this context is not so highly important, but I still think we should, you know, we should treat patients to the most modern standard, as you guys always do. I mean, you do the best proper TAVA procedures ever, you know, and they have you know, proceeded to a certain high level that everybody of you follows. Seems not to be the case in surgery for reasons that I don't understand. Because especially when it comes to small annually, there are techniques of overcoming the problem. And you can completely abolish patient prosthesis mismatch with using the use of proper surgical techniques. So this is the Manugian technique just as an example on how to do a root enlargement. And then there's a the prejudice that root enlargement increases the risk of surgery. And this is why some surgeons step away from it. They've never done it, but they heard it may be dangerous, so they don't do it. But this is a fault, because we have data on thousands of patients showing that root enlargement does not increase surgical risk. This was a publication already from 2018 in circulation showing this in a very large number of patients. So procedural excellence in surgery for me means that we should use only versus proven durability that we should new, not use these valves with the pericardium mounted outside the stand. We don't do this anymore. Nobody does it anymore. Root enlargement needs to be done. And this affords CT planning. You do CT planning in every Tarver case. We should do CT planning in every surgical case because then we know the size of the annulus and we can plan the procedure and we can pick the one surgeon who's capable of doing a root enlargement. And we should also not mistake the labeled valve size for the true inner diameter, because if you pick A25 valve off shelf, the inner diameter of those valves is very different. You know, mitral floor is just 21 inner diameter, so it's basically a 21 valve, while the Inspirus valve has a 25 inner diameter. This is a true 25 valve. And if you just pick a 25 and look at the, at the package, you're totally um, off scale. And definitely no patient prosthesis mismatch. So will RIA impact guidelines, maybe yes in a certain way. To me, changing the guidelines towards TAVI first in every woman and in every patient with a small annulus would be really a major change. It would ignore the advantages of modern surgical techniques, including root enlargement. We already know that TAV and SAV in the small surgical bioprocesses is a challenge, right? But we know that TAF and TAF in a small TAV device can really be detrimental, especially when you remember the results of the SMART trial, you might be intrigued to use a self-expanding valve in a small annulus in order to get better hemodynamics, but doing a TAF and TAF in a self-expanding valve in a small annulus, this is rather dangerous and difficult, and it's not what we do every day. So I think that the guidelines should call for surgery and smart learning being done in centers where root enlargement is part of the armamentarium, and they should call for doing CT scans in every patient, but they should not necessarily call for doing TAVI first in every woman and in every patient with small annulus. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Hendrik. And now for closing this uh, far part of the uh, REIA, we have Mariuka Nicotera that will present a case example. Thank you very much, Victoria. So I brought a very interesting um, case from, uh, from my practice. These are my conflict of interest. Uh, it's a lady who actually approached me on my, um, on my endeavor to, uh, to promote the treatment of hortic stenosis in a quite conservative area of Germany in the Black Forest. Uh, and she came to me after one of these uh, talks and uh, she told me, I think I also have this, uh, this uh, uh, pathology you're talking about. So um, I asked her to, to my clinic. And uh, indeed, in the echocardiographic assessment, uh, she had a very um, calcified, uh, high-grade aortic valve stenosis with a, a max uh, velocity of over five meter per second. The max uh, and mean gradient was, were 107 and 67 uh, millimeter of mercury, and um, uh, aortic valve area per VTI of uh, 0.65 square centimeter. She had a good uh, left ventricular systolic uh, function uh, and a hypertrophy uh, left ventricle. The, no comorbidities, she just had treatment for hypertension, quite fit lady, uh, no problem whatsoever. So uh, we did the CT assessment of the, of the valve and uh, you can see here an, a mean annulus of 21.9, so with a perimeter derived of, uh, of 23 millimeter and a perimeter of 72.3 quite horizontal aorta, as you can uh, see in the, in the angle angulation, and an asymmetrical tricuspid aortic valve uh, with uh, calcification mostly on the non-coronary cusp. The LVOT was quite uh, funnel-shaped with, uh, with a diameter of 20.8 uh, uh, centimeter. These are the access routes, a bit of uh, kinking in the aorta, but uh, good uh, femoral, uh, transfemoral access. So to, uh, we discussed this lady in the heart team, and uh, Hendrik, uh, I was uh, uh, very lucky that the patient turned 75 on the 17th of, uh, of November this year. So uh, she was uh, good in the guidelines has a severe, really asymptomatic aortic valve stenosis, very low Euroscore 2 and STS score in the really low, low risk category. Uh, her, her wish was uh, not to have surgery. So she was uh, very keen to have the valve replaced, but uh, not by surgery. So we said uh, that's, uh, that's a decent uh, decision, and we um, uh, decided for a transfemoral TAVI with a balloon expandable Sapien 3 Ultra 23 uh, millimeters. The procedure itself was, um, was straightforward. There was uh, nothing of age interesting. She had a sort of uh, um, um, maybe fibrodysplasia on the, on the femoral arteries. Uh, didn't go away with uh, nitrate. Uh, the, coronary, just, uh, the coronary uh, arteries were normal, so um, no, no problems uh, there. Uh, and in the root uh, angiography, uh, you can uh, see the tricuspid. This was not the implantation side. We also had a route for the right coronary arteries, which was difficult to engage um, with a catheter. Um, the procedure was uh, so straightforward. No, no pre-dilatation. Um, we implanted the valve. You can appreciate the very horizontal anatomy. So this, uh, I think, was a good choice for the balloon expandable. And the result was uh, really excellent. No aortic regurgitation and um, no need for pacing. This pacing wire, not, don't get confused, is a, in our setting we use still a screw in uh, wire. Uh, we are trying to get uh, rid of it, but uh, it's not a permanent pacemaker she has, it's, a, it's a temporary we use for the TAVI procedure. This is the excellent hemodynamic after that. So I think even if a really straightforward case, it opens uh, interesting discussions point as, as, as to treat or to not to treat or to wait, which uh, kind of uh, procedure, SAVR or, or, or uh, TAVR, and obviously which valve, balloon expandable or self-expandable. Thank you very much for your attention. 
thank you very much, Mariuk. And I think that you uh, posted already the questions for the panel <laughs> to answer. So who is the one, the first one that wants to answer one of these questions, what to do in a patient? I think that 75 year old, for example, in my environment will be towards perhaps Tavi without not much discussion. But it's true that, for example, at 64, as uh, Julia uh, presented, that will be maybe, if would not be um, considered not surgical, would have got a mechanical valve. So <laughs> this is uh, how we have, for example, in, uh, in some centers. So we, who wants to start the discussion? Uh, concerning the, the indication, I would say exactly the same, 75 for, for us and for the heart team, it's TAVI first, of course, except if there is a, a risk of something. And uh, 64 is, um, is surgery, but if there is any um, potential risk of a wish of the patient, we send the patient to the surgeon, and then the, the patient can come back to TAVI if the surgeon decides, but uh, that's our strategy. Yeah. I, I think I really like the point of Hendrik. I think at the end of the day, you need to look at the CAT scan, um, whatever the age. Obviously, in US, 65 is ab and above, but um, you do the CAT scan, and a lot of time in a woman, and, and or small, small anatomy, small annulus, mean small sinuses, mean low coronary, mean a lot of things are small. And I, even if I want to apply the SMART trial, I, I wasn't rolling in the SMART trial. A lot of patients were excluded because the sinus was not big enough for a self expendable valve. And I don't think it's a, advocate enough. So for me, for the same thing you said that to do TAVI on, on a woman um, compared to surgery, to say that we need to do self expendable in a woman compared to balloon expendable is so dangerous because it's, the devil is in the detail. The devil is into the cat scan planning, the sizing, and there's always one characteristic that makes you favor one valve or one approach or the other. So the meticulous planning is key. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm always more in favor of a balloon expendable, especially as the age go lower because of the cornea access and the treat, treatment of tab and tab and tab or whatever. And also explant. Uh, if endocarditis occur, blah, blah, blah. One thing I have to say with the root enlargement, I think um, if we can uh, uh, clone you and have people that can do root enlargement around the country or the world would be great. Same thing for Ross surgeon uh, and same thing for all, vas all arterial cabbage. I, I feel that the algorithm for root enlargement with surgeon is very um, heterogeneous across US. Sometimes I send, I say, I would like a root enlargement. The patient come back with no root enlargement. Um, so I think we, we, we need to make sure that root enlargement are done, uh, I would say, more um, diffusely uh, globally and teach well, because sometimes it may increase their risk. The thing I find difficult for TAV and SAV in root enlargement is the valve is canted. I don't know what you do for, for root enlargement. Sometimes it's a little canted. It's, it's, it's kind of a complexified little bit, the TAV and SAV, which is not, I mean, it's not hard to overcome, but there's a, I think we need to plan the first surgery with um, having in mind also potentially TAV and SAV. So I don't know what you, you want to say to this. Yeah, we had the discussion on the canted valves, actually. If you do it properly, there's no canted valve. Yeah. If you do, it, it may happen in the new gene if you choose a too small patch. And then you want to have that increase in size, and this is why you place your sutures more high up in the patch, and then you have a canted valve. So if you, if you do a new gene, you have to really use a very large patch, what seems contradictory doing the operation, but then only when you do the sutures, you find out it's good. If you do bow young, you will never have canted valves uh, anymore. So I think this is a problem that could be overcome uh, surgically. And it is our, our responsibility as surgeons to teach this. Mm. And the numbers are increasing a lot in Germany. Mm. We have the discussion this morning. In Germany, there's pressure because we have concurrence and um, also concurrence among surgical centers. Um, while in other countries, there's, there's a long waiting list for surgery. So nobody feels the pressure to change his behavior. But it will come, basically, when you guys take over, do Tavi and everyone, then they feel the pressure of less surgical patients coming in. Maybe then they change, but it might be too late then. But, but yeah, it's, our, it's absolutely our responsibility as surgeons to change this in a, in a good way, that people are trained and learn this, because it's much different from a ROS procedure. ROS procedure is really something for specialists, I would say, but this is not for specialists. It's something that you can really learn, and you don't have to understand rocket science to, to make this done. Uh, I, I, yeah. Uh, okay. 
I, I think, you know, Nigeria. on the same topic of root enlargement, I think I agree with Philip. It's difficult to generalize to all centers and all surgeons. And I think the REA trial really reflect the average real life surgical practice. And yes, there was 0% root enlargement because I think the, the people were, you know, weighing the risk versus benefit. And, and, and despite the fact there was 0% root enlargement, the rate of severe mismatch was actually very low uh, in, in the surgical harm as well as in the, in the TAVR harm. It's, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a women population, small body size, so it helps. And interestingly, uh, in the partner tree, we had 6% uh, what the root enlargement, so uh, somewhat higher than in, in, in REA. And we never published this data, but we have a slide somewhere. But in the subgroup when there went root enlargement mortality was, and we are talking about early mortality, unfortunately, was a threefold higher. So I see the benefit of root enlargement for preventing mismatch and lifetime management, especially because we know that redo or valve in, in, in SAV in small failed surgical valves is associated with poor outcomes. So, but this is a longer term perspective and, and you have to pay the price of maybe an increased early mortality, at least on average results, you know, maybe not in your center, but you know. So I think, especially in this population, you know, uh, elderly patient with often calcified aortic root, I know it's a simple technique, but still, you know, maybe associated with complication in this population. I would like to come back to the mechanical valve, actually. Mm. My patient was young, but uh, biologically she was not young. And I think we always have to take into consideration someone with morbid obesity and uh, diabetes. She is not expected to live until into her 90s. And I would never advise a mechanical valve in such a patient because the, 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 as soon as she has her second uh, hip replacement, um, there is a bleeding complication. And when we, plant this, when we plan these young patients or any patients that we expect that probably we will have to implant a second valve, so a, a life expectancy of 10 years or more, we have to plan for the second valve at the time of the first TAVI. Mm. And that's why I would not um, choose a tall frame or, uh, or be rather reluctant to, do, to choose a, a tall frame yeah. um, prosthesis in these patients. So we... we, we yeah. Regarding uh, the and, age... And if I think we have to discuss more with the surgeons because if they can uh, guarantee that they will put in 25 uh, millimeter prosthesis, which they then often don't put in, although they promise to do their best to do a large prosthesis, even in, in men, uh, yeah, then, we can, then it's easier for us to manage the patient. And I have not seen root enlargement in my lifetime, and I've worked in three centers. So I would be happy if I see a patient once in my life. We need, <laughs> we need several clones of Enrique. That's the issue. <laughs> Philippe. Regarding the, uh, the age, you know, uh, cut point, 75, you know, in European guidelines on this side of the Atlantic, you know, it's a different story in, in North America. But uh, one interesting finding of the pooled analysis of Raya and partner three women uh, that uh, Ellen uh, led actually is that we, when we did the sensitivity analysis, there was a greater superiority of TAVR versus SAVR uh, for hospitalization, but also for, for mortality uh, in the patients younger than 75 years old. So we felt maybe that would be an argument maybe to, mm. to uh, revise the, this cut point, you know, uh, to the, the, the lower hand. It's, a, it's an important metaphor, isn't it, uh, Enrique, that the first cut is the deepest, and, and the surgeon usually, historically, has had the first cut. And I, I admire your approach where you take 19 millimeter valves out of the OR, and there are many TAVI centers where they've taken 20 millimeter balloon expandable valves out of the cath lab for the same reason, because we should not be putting in two small devices in younger patients. It's, it's creating the wrong platform for the next sequence of procedures. Completely agree. But how, how do we go about changing practice? I, I think that, that's the challenge, isn't it? Because I, I heard a data point this morning 4% of AVRs in the US are combined with root enlargement. Yeah, but you know, the, even if there was an increased risk in the partner three subgroup of patients who got root enlargement, I mean, if you do a procedure, let's say you are all expert TAVI implanters, but imagine you would do only three TAVIs a year. 
how would your results look like, right? Would they be the same qual high quality? No. You have to do it on a frequent basis and then you get good results. There's a learning curve to overcome for everyone. It can be done in a way, as, as we, when we teach, you know, upcoming centers of young, young interventionalists doing TAVR, we don't let them do that on their own and we just look from the outside, oh, patient didn't make it. So we, we teach them, we go to the table, we teach them how to do it. So this is how we as surgeons can do it. They can come to my center, then I go to their center, I teach them how to do it. And since this is not a large learning curve, it's okay, and this is the way we should go. We just have to understand this. And this is the hardest part for me that I have still to convince my surgical colleagues. I mean, this is ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, why haven't you seen that in Austria in three centers? In ge one German as well. And one German center also. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit of a pity, but I think it's changing. You know, I want to be positive. I think it's changing. It's changing definitely in Germany. It will change in other countries too. It will change in the US. Uh, just because it's so obvious that something needs to be done. Yeah, but I think as cardiologists, we also have a duty that we need to hold our surgeons to account and say this is the operation we are agreeing that you should do yeah. Yeah. In, the, in the patient's interest, not to keep the cardiologists happy, yeah. in the patient's interest. I, I have to say that I, I see this change happening in the U.S. as there's more competition with the Ross Center, for example, in New York. There's a couple of Ross guys that came and then another one came in and one came in my center. And those Ross guys are getting very good at do, uh, root sparing and root enlargement. So I think the field is going in the right direction because there's more and more specialized surgeons. And this is what I like. I want to build a center where the mortality as a program for AVR is the lowest possible. The stroke rate is a, it's a, color, a programmatic growth where you bring the right people to do the right thing. So if you bring an aortic surgeon that is able to do all that, the patient would benefit that you have more tools. Is it generalizable? No. I think all the decision has to be taken on a local basis because um, if, if my fear is if you start to open all the, a lot of TAVR center, you, we're going to kill TAVR. Same thing, all the surgeons start to do ROS, this is over for ROS. So I think you need expert that grow and the grow take time, and, but I think it's all in a good uh, um, uh, benefit for the patients. You know. So thanks, Philippe. And, uh, we've been doing a bit of horizon scanning and thinking about the future, which is a nice link to Philippe's uh, final presentation which is talking about the unmet clinical needs right now. And of course, this is going to drive the future phase of clinical trials. So Philippe, Thank give you. us some open questions. Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, so uh, these are my, my conflict of interest. So the, the first uh, unmet need, well, not maybe anymore unmet, but is early intervention in asymptomatic severe AS and also the next step at risk moderate AS. So uh, there are several trials for um, uh, early uh, TAVR or AVR in asymptomatic severe AS that came to, uh, to an end and they were presented recently. And, uh, uh, and, and in terms of moderate AS, um, I think, you know, uh, there is one, one trial, which is the TAVR no trial in patients with moderate AS and systolic heart failure, so higher risk subgroups. And this was presented at TCT and actually in, and published in JAK. And uh, we, uh, we missed the primary endpoint. There was some uh, numerical advantage in favor of an early TAVR versus a uh, heart failure therapy. Um, and, but this was uh, uh, significant if we would uh, restrict the primary endpoint at one year follow-up because the primary endpoint was at the longest follow-up. So still, I think there is a, maybe an advantage of doing an early intervention in this patient with moderate AS and systolic heart failure. So it's very difficult, you know, to, to, I don't have a crystal ball that uh, uh, helped me to predict what the guidelines will do. Uh, but I think in, in terms of asymptomatic severe AS, with all the evidence that Philip showed you, the early TAVR, the EVOL, the avatar, the recovery, the meta-analysis, I think the guidelines will move to a uh, probably consider early AVR, not necessarily TAVI, um, and with probably a class one with B evidence. That's my prediction. So, uh, and for moderate AS with systolic heart failure, that is the only subset that we have addressed yet with a trial. I think the guideline would say we may consider early TAVI, but it would probably, probably not a very strong recommendation to be something. 
Um, and for the other at-risk moderate AS, we need to wait for the results of the ongoing major trial, especially the PROGRESS trial, where the recruitment was completed, and expand TAVA2 that is still recruiting. And the, you know, uh, Bernard was asking, what makes you nervous with uh, early TAVI in asymptomatic uh, severe AS? Well, the bicuspid valve, especially the bicuspid valve with anostyle anatomy, a calcified raphe, or uh, uh, massive excessive calcification, because this uh, hostile anatomy has been shown with uh, uh, worse outcome uh, following TAVI, and especially, of course, if there is an autopathy on the top of that. And indeed, in the Notion 2 trial, TAVI was shown to be non-inferior to SAVR in tricuspid valve stenosis, but in bicuspid valve stenosis, overall, TAVI was inferior to SAVR. So uh, I think uh, we need a randomized trial of TAVI versus SAVR in balloon expandable valve. There, is, there are at least two major trials that will start soon. This is uh, just the example of the Believers trial where we're going to randomize patients with BAV stenosis older than 50 years old and with an alta less than 45, and they will be randomized to TAVR versus SAVR. And uh, one open question, of course, is there any difference between the different TAVI platform in bicuspid valve and also in tricuspid valve AS? So this is a study just published uh, last week. It's, it's, it's not randomized, the propensity score, but showing that in the bicuspid valve, well, uh, balloon expandable valve are associated with lower rate of complication, especially pacemaker implantation and moderate severe PVL, but somewhat more mismatch compared to self-expanding. I think we need trials uh, for to compare. We are at a point where we need to compare the different platform of TAVI and see if there is difference or not. And well, the SMART trial is one of the few trials that compare the two platform. It's for the small analysts only, predominantly women. Well, at at one year, there was no difference in the primary clinical endpoint of mortality, uh, a stroke or rehospitalization. We have to wait for longer follow-up. And I think we need more definitive trial for all comers. This is the best trial, for example, that is uh, a pragmatic trial conducted in France, randomizing patient to TAVI balloon expandable versus self-expanding in both tricuspid valve and bicuspid valve. It's independent of industry, and the primary endpoint is a composite of technical failure, stroke mortality at 90 days or in one year, close to 2,000 patients. Also, another unmet need is pure aortic regurgitation. We got earlier this year uh, the results of the Align AR trial, which is a prospective multicenter single arm study using the Trilogy technology, which is in fact the Genovalve, and showing encouraging results, uh, of course, we need now probably randomized trials and more evidence. Uh, and finally, you know, one very uh, important uh, open question is lifetime management. We need more data. And certainly when you have patients with a li long life expectancy between 20 and 30 years, maybe the first choice should be a SAVR. And, 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 but then you know that you expose the patient probably to, uh, to, uh, to some redo intervention, maybe two or, or uh, at least one or two, uh, if the patient has a life expectancy between 10 and 20, well, then there is this choice that we need to do carefully and wisely between TAVA versus SAVA. The first valve is very important. And, and these patients may require a, a, a reintervention. And for those with life expectancy less than 10 years, well, decision is easier. Uh, it's probably going to be a, a, a TAVI, and uh, there would be no need for a reintervention. And this is my last slide. I think, you know, the, the strategy for lifetime management, the choice of the first valve is definitely critical and will determine, will predict the future as we previously discussed in this session. It's like when you, you play chess, you know, the first move you do will determine your game and, and probably the outcome of the game. Um, so there are certainly several factors to consider uh, in this choice for the first valve. The early valve hemodynamics outcome are important, especially the risk of PVL. The early clinical outcomes are important, the risk of early mortality, stroke, and, and, and rehospitalization, bad complication. But we also have to think about the risk of permanent pacemaker implantation. It may look benign you know, in the first place, but we start to see after five years, this pacemaker implantation is associated with increased risk of mortality. Future access to coronary arteries is critical too. Long-term valve durability, of course. And also, not only that, but the risk complexity and, and outcomes of reintervention, as we just discussed, you know. And, and finally, not to be forgotten, patient preferences, of course. Thank you very much. So, patient preferences with a patient well informed, <laughs> that is always sometimes the question. <laughs>
But I think it's also true that patients are increasingly well informed. There's a lot of information, there's a lot of literature, and in truth there is a lot of patient-based organisations who are channeling this information to patients with heart valve disease. I think Julia's point about better screening and early diagnosis in primary care, as we call it in the UK, family medicine, is also very, very important. But we also need to remember that these family physicians are very busy with other, many other priorities. So we also need to take uh, some lead and, and take the initiative on these screening programmes, I believe. So we talked a little bit about some of those challenges, Philippe, and there are many, of course. Um, I think it's fair to say, would you agree anatomically, and I know procedurally LN will agree with me, that not all bicuspids are the same. And, and we need to bear that in mind. The you know, results of notion two, it doesn't distinguish the different subtypes, exactly. for example. No, there's definitely an anatomy that is hostile, you know, this, this bicuspid valve. It's interesting because if you remember the early days of TAVI, we're excluding the, excluding the bicuspid valve, and especially the type zero. And we're thinking that the type zero will be the, the worst. And actually, when we accumulated the data with the registry of bicuspid valve, we found that the one that is, uh, and, and this is for logical reason, but the, the, the one with the, uh, the bicuspid, uh, the, uh, the bicuspid with this very calcified raffae, which create an asymmetry uh, and, and under deployment or misdeployment of the valve aren't really the ones that are associated with, with worse outcomes. And of course, there is always this question of the, out, the concomitant autopathy, you know. How do we, if the patient is not operable or is very high risk, then of course, we'll, we'll live with that. But otherwise, I, I think this is an important decision. And I still believe, you know, that if you have a patient with a bicuspid valve, calcified raffae, autopathy, and it's not extreme risk, SAVA is probably the best, mm. the best option for these patients. And Hendrik, you actually see these bicuspid valves in a way that we do not. I mean, sometimes the calcification on them is very florid, isn't it? The notion that you can bang in a balloon expandable valve and get away with it is perhaps naive. Yeah, it is, no, well, I wouldn't tell it naive, but um, we know somehow now from CT scans which valves are good uh, targets for, for TAVI, which valves are not. But we definitely need a trial, and we're working on there. Two trials on the way in, in comparing by cuspids. So I, I'd be very curious to see the outcome of those, and then we have more data. But right now, I would say if there's a bicuspid valve and there's no futility for surgery, then I would go for surgery mm -hmm. first at this stage. And, of course, a lot of these bicuspid valves also develop regurgitation rather than stenosis. So... Julia, did you see, do you see a lot of aortic regurgitation in your practice? In the UK, we don't seem to see that much. No, not so much. Mm. Not so much. But if, if they pop up at present, they, it's, it's difficult to treat. With new, new devices are coming, larger devices, and um, yeah. Yeah. My understanding in, in other countries, China and India, for example, they see a lot of aortic regurgitation, perhaps as a result of rheumatic disease. I'm not sure. But so it might be a different paradigm there. But Ellen, do you think TAVI for AR has a rosy future? <coughs> I'm not sure. Because um, when uh, there is, I mean, in uh, our daily practice, the pa these patients are very, not very um, common. I mean, and then when they are, they are younger. So the young will be, uh, will expose to the problem of lifetime expectancy. And I think they should better go to surgery, except if they are at high risk. And also when you have aortic regurgitation, if you have calcif associated calcification, even with very mild aortic stenosis, they can go to TAVI. So... Um, but dedicated devices are, f of course, welcome because uh, we know that with the, what, what we have today, we have the risk of embolization and uh, the need for second valve. So it's not the, the best we have today. Yeah, mm. for sure. I have, I have to say that um, when you do only look at severe AI with current trigger for uh, guideline trigger for treatment, it's not a lot. But when you start to look at moderate to severe with the same trigger, the pull increase. I think there's a little bit of a... Um, underappreciation of the frequency of AI in the real world. When we start to run actually um, AI software for the community and we saw that there's a lot of moderate AI out there. I think there's potentially um, underappreciation. It's hard to grade uh, AI severity by echo. So I think uh, there's more than we think. Uh, obviously, it's not Taver. I mean, we, it's never going to be like Taver, obviously. But there's more than we think because we don't look at it because there's no... It's like TAVR, like before TAVR, AS was a dormant disease. 
you know, all of a sudden the AI is everywhere. And, and I think AI might be the same, maybe not the same magnitude, but um, I, I think there's more than we think. Uh, the problem with AI is a lot of time, every time I screen someone for Genevalve, it's like, oh, there's big root, there's bicuspid, there's, there's always those, uh, there's more concomitant disease that makes surgery more indicated. For sure. Yeah. Can you give us an update on progress? When is it likely to present and publish? Can you share that with us? Yes, absolutely. So we finished enrollment almost a year uh, ago, so we're going to be ready to present the data uh, for every, all the patient, we get two years data like early TAVR, so um, most likely either ACC or uh, TCT or AHA um, 2026. 2026. Yeah, okay. so everyone will get two years, so it's very exciting, 750 patients. Um, so that's what we're targeting. So somewhere in 2026. Okay, so watch this space. Victoria, do you have any questions? Yeah, no, I was. Uh, I like the the discussion about the aortic regurgitation because what is true as well, and that reminds me uh, the remarks that we had at the moment that you put severe aortic regurgitation, severe aortic stenosis. The physician that receives the report needs to do something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then needs to ask for symptoms and everything. And many times uh, for aortic regurgitation, we also check for the hemodynamic consequences on the ventricle if there is not an aortic root that is dilated. So if it's not dilated, you may say maybe more moderate severe if the patient is asymptomatic and you continue. So you don't give perhaps the importance that it is, but there is accumulating data as well that show that actually those cutoff values of remodeling of the ventricle perhaps were too lax or um, too conservative and per perhaps we should be more aggressive and treating earlier. Particularly, for example, in women, and indeed the trial of uh, the um, TAVI in uh, aortic regurgitation included many women, for example, as well. No, I agree. I think we, we, with the, the, the criteria and threshold that we have in the, in the guidelines, we underestimate AR and we probably intervene too late uh, in AR uh, in general, especially in women, for sure. But I think if you want to save time, you just do one trial and you call it early progress and you do severe to moderate AI with no symptom, TAVR versus surveillance, and you're going to fix the problem. So don't wait too long. Let's do that, Philippe. So we have already the plan. <laughs> so there we go. I think it's time that we can draw the session to an end. It's been a great discussion. I'm sure we could be here all evening discussing the future of aortic stenosis. But equally, I know that you've all got good things to do in London this evening. So. We discussed, uh, we focused on two trials in, in specific terms, uh, early TAVA and RIA, and it's a great privilege to have the primary investigators of those trials here with us uh, in room four here in London. We've also seen some very nice case examples that uh, illustrate the, the everyday clinical challenges that we face. And we've also had a good look into Endrique's crystal ball in relation to the guidelines uh, that will be forthcoming from Europe next year. So thank you very much for joining us in the session. Thank you for staying late here at Excel. I hope you have a great evening this evening, and we look forward to seeing you for the last day of London Vowels tomorrow. Thanks very much. <laughs>